Hello, my name is Cameron McQuarrie. I'm a scientist at Arcadia Science in Berkeley, California. And today I'm going to be talking to you briefly about how actin and myosin contribute to cell wall integrity in the model diatom Phyodactylum tricornatum. These cells are unique in their ability to take on multiple different morph types. Um, so as you can see, they can form fusiform cells, which are tapered on both ends. Um, these triangular triradiate cells, um, oval cells, or cell wallless protoplasts. Recent work suggests that the actin cytoskeleton might be contributing to cell shape determinations. On the bottom left, you can see these cells stained with phylloidin to visualize the actin cytoskeleton fluorescently. You can see F actin is heavily localized near the cell cortex, possibly giving structure to these shapes. Further, Recent work looking at the differential gene expression across cell shapes indicated that actin capping and severing proteins have an inverse expression relationship with bundling and nucleating proteins when comparing fusiform or triradiate cells with ovular cells. This further suggests a role for actin in cell morphology decision making. To test this, we treated these cells with cytoskeletal inhibitors and measured the percent of cells in each morphotype. Surprisingly, when we treat it with the myosin-2 inhibitor blebostatin or the ARP2-3 complex inhibitor CK666, we saw a drastic increase in the amount of what appear to be protoplasts forming. Increased protoplasts were also observed when treated with the actin polymerization inhibitor latrinculin B or the formin inhibitor SMIFH2, but less frequently. On the previous slide, we observed several round cells after two hours of treatment but didn't observe any of these cells forming. So we decided to treat the cells with a cell wall degrading enzyme, alkylase, and observe these cells in real time. Here we indeed see a protoplast emerging from the cell. To confirm that the inhibitors were actually disrupting the cytoskeleton, we treated cells with the drugs and stained with phylloidin. Consistent with the protoplast formation, latrinculin B, CK666, and blebostatin substantially disrupted the localization. Surprisingly, treatment with the formin inhibitor SMIFH2 actually increased f actin staining. Although these results were very exciting for us, they were also very confusing because CK666, which targets the ARP23 complex, ideally shouldn't have an effect on these cells because them and other diatoms do not have an ARP2-3 complex. So CK666 is a small molecule that will bind to both ARP2 and ARP3, these two actin-related proteins, and it will actually um, prevent the conformational change needed to activate this complex. Because ARP2 is so similar to actin, we hypothesize that CK666 might be binding to diatom actins in the absence of an ARP2-3 complex. We took the solved structure of CK666 bound to bovine ARP2 and ran some predictions replacing ARP2 with diatom actins and actin-related proteins. The binding pocket is in dark gray and the CK666 molecule is in white. As you can see, the orientation of CK666 is very similar between bovine ARP2 and the phyodactylum actin-1 and actin-2, suggesting CK666 may indeed be directly inhibiting actin polymerization. Recent work has highlighted the presence of silica nanoparticles can alter actin localization and function. On the left, you can see these cells were treated with the silica nanoparticle in P30 and stained with phylloidin in green, and you can see that the actin staining is heavily disrupted when treated with the nanoparticle. Uh, and on the right, you can see these cells were treated with another nanoparticle, MSNP2, and after treatment, the cells formed several philopodia, while the control did not. Diatoms incorporate silica into their cell walls. However, however, phyodactylum is unique in its ability to survive in the absence of silica, making it a great system to probe the impacts of silica on physiological processes. To determine if silica plays a role in cell morphology, we grew cells in the presence or absence of silica. Silica-free media was prepared and stored in plastic bottles, and cells were grown in plastic flasks to avoid residual silica from borosilicate labware from seeping into the media. Interestingly, 
cells from two different strains grown in the silica-free media formed more protoplasts than cells grown in the presence of silica. Whether this is dependent on a silica-actin relationship or if silica just strengthens the cell wall independent of actin is currently unclear. We were able to visualize live actin dynamics in these cells using the SPI555 FASTAC dye. Although much of the dye appeared to stay in the chloroplast, the dynamic cortical puncta are reminiscent of endocytic actin patches found in several eukaryotes. However, when grown in the absence of silica, the patches appear to have shorter lifetimes and bleach quicker. Again, whether this is because of an actin-silica relationship, or if silica-free cells just have a weaker cell wall and need less actin to carry out endocytosis, is unclear. However, this data is very preliminary and will be improved upon by tagging actin patches with a fluorescent marker rather than staining with the dye. Thank you so much for your attention and for taking the time to watch this talk. Um, these are the contributors of the work. This work is part of a larger project hoping to understand the evolution of actin binding proteins across diverse species. And you can follow this work and other ongoing projects at Arcadia uh, by going to research.arcadiascience.com and reading all the pubs and feel free to publicly comment and give us your feedback. Um, thank you again for your attention and have a great day.